Hello, everybody. My name is Mark Fisher, and I want to welcome you to our channel, Our Scientology Stories, Peeling the Onion. And I'm here with my co-host, Janice Gillum-Grady. Hi, Janice. Hi, Mark, and hi, everybody. Welcome back. Uh, today, we're going to do part two of L. Ron Hubbard's Messengers, which were called the Commodore's Messengers. I was one from the age of 12 years old. Up in, and I was in the SEAL for 22 years, so I was a Commodore's messenger for basically 22 years, uh, starting at the age of 12. And for the first 11 years, I was with LRH most of the time, six hours a day, every day of the week, except for if I was on Liberty or sent on mission or he went somewhere for a few months. So uh, it's a long history with Hubbard directly of which there's only two other people who were like that that are alive today. That's exactly right. And uh, my name is Mark Fisher, as I mentioned, and I was in the, joined the Sea uh, Organization out of high school. Uh, I was there the last six years that I was in the Sea Organization. I worked directly for David Miscavige, and I ran his personal office at the International Base in Gilman Hot Springs. And Janice and I have been friends for over 40 years, and we're telling our stories uh, through this uh, YouTube channel and we hope that you enjoy them. We're trying to fill in the history for people who don't know what was what was happening. And then here's, I wanna show you here, this is uh, the thumbnail that we used for this uh, story, which is L. Ron Hubbard's Messengers part two, okay? Now I just wanna let everybody know, if you're watching this and you haven't seen part one, that's okay, no problem. You can watch this one and then go back and watch uh, part one. They're self-contained. But please watch both of them. We want you to watch them both. So if you haven't already, please do so. We also want to ask you to click that like button. It helps us get the message out to more people on YouTube. And of course, if you haven't subscribed already, we would appreciate it if you would subscribe to us and hit that notification button. And then you'll be notified every time we have uh, new videos uh, come up. Right, Janice? Correct. <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> All right, so let's get started here. This is a, uh, uh, we're going to go through, we're going to show you a lot of photographs that you've never been seen by the general public. You're going to see photographs of L. Ron Hubbard and his messengers and life on the uh, flagship Apollo. So get ready. Uh, I think you're going to enjoy it. And here we go. Okay. All right, so this is a slide, first slide here. It just says what we're doing here. And Janice, go ahead and tell people what that is. Okay, well, this is the Royal Scotman. Uh, this is where I showed up there in January 1968 and lived on that ship for the next eight years of my life, from 11 years old to 19. And um, we were in Spain at the time, and we traveled different Mediterranean ports. Then once we were in Greece in 69, uh, the name was changed from Royal Scotland to the Apollo. And then after we got kicked out of Greece, we went into dry dock in uh, Casablanca and painted the ship white. So we can go to the next slide. And and it, it used to be a cattle ferry or something, right? Before, uh, it, it, before Scientology bought it? Yes, it was a cattle ferry that went back and forth between Ireland and uh, England. And actually during World War II, it was a uh, carrier for the troops. Got it, okay, great. All right, so let's go to the next one here. So there she is all painted white and uh, with the name Apollo there. And uh, we sailed the rest of the time up until 1975 on her as the Apollo. And how old were you when you were on the ship? Well, I showed up at 11 years old and I left when I was 19. And you and got the actually, tour, tour of the world, for the right? First, for the first five years, I'd never gone anywhere except for on Liberty, or sometimes we'd actually gone ashore for a short period. Um, in 1971, January, the ship was to sail to Spain to do some public relations because Hubbard was not allowed in Spain. So he actually got off the ship while we were in Agadir, and the messengers went with him. You can go to the next slide. Okay. And here's Agadir. And that's the mountaintop that, as kids, we used to climb up there to the very top. The Agadir town used to be at the top, and then there was an earthquake that destroyed it. And they ended up rebuilding the town. You can go to the next slide. Let me ask you a question. What country is this in, Agadir? Again? Oh, sorry. This is in Morocco. 
in Morocco. Okay. Yes. Yeah. It's it's one of the more southern parts of Morocco. So right. this is this is Agadir once it got rebuilt, and the picture is actually taken from the top of the mountain, the hill, looking down. Mm -hmm. Now in January we actually moved ashore for one month while the ship left us behind and went to Spain, as I was saying. And uh, there's some funny stories there where the Commodore was living in a separate house with Mary Sue and a few staff and the aides and the messengers, we stayed at a hotel called Hotel Modern. Uh -huh. And it had just been built, but it, ha it didn't have regular toilets. So we had the ship's carpenter build us a toilet to go over the hole in the ground. And um, we had a hotel attendant, his name was Habib. And Habib used to like to hang out with us younger girls. Um, we didn't stand watches with the Commodore during this time period. Instead, we were made the kitchen stewards for the aides. And so we served all the meals to the aides and set the tables, washed the dishes, and basically felt that we were slaves. And wow. uh, Suzette, Suzette was with us, Suzette Hubbard. And she was a great poet. She was very good with words. And I can remember some of the lines that she wrote. Um, and we sent this to the ship, the ship, and they put it in the orders of the day. And the poem goes, um, with bars on our windows and locks on our door, we're even chained to the cold bare floor. <laughs> <laughs> and because we, we missed the ship and everybody on the ship. And here we were being kitchen slaves. Well, let me ask you a couple questions. Okay. In this photograph here, is that the port? Like was the Apollo docked down there in there somewhere? Or, it, or it, would, it would be more to the right of this picture. Okay. And then yeah. the other question I was going to ask, you, you mentioned how, you know, like L. Ron Hubbard would go ashore and, and you guys would get a villa or whatever. Was it, was there like an Airbnb service for Commodores at that time? Or how, how did you guys find these places? You know, the, the ship's rep or the someone in the port captain's office would find it or a, in coordination with the household unit and who would go and inspect and make sure it's okay. And the port captain's office would have found Hotel Modern, which hadn't even opened as a hotel yet. So it, it was available. We took the whole hotel. And you would just rent the space, right? Obviously, you didn't buy it. Yeah, correct. Okay. All right, here's the next one. All right, so this is back to back on the ship. Um, I just wanted to, I pointed this out in the last uh, video, but this is where the messengers sat outside the Commodore's, we called it the research room. And after the ship came back from Spain, the Commodore wanted more messengers than just the four originals, Claire, mm -hmm. Terry, Annie, and myself. Right. So uh, that's why there's now two chairs there. There used to just be one chair with a table. And uh, one Commodore would call messenger and one of us would get up and run in there, usually the senior messenger. And we would take the message runs and go do whatever. And then he'd always have the other messenger who was in training uh, near him in case he needs something else. Got well, it. we're off on a message run. All right, we can go to the next slide. All right. Okay, this picture here is the Commodore talking to Hannah Eltringham on the right and the back of uh, Jill Castrum. Uh, they were both uh, personal aides to Hubbard. I believe at this time, Jill was probably the staff captain and Hannah was probably Commodore Staff 1, meaning she was over all the HCOs. And as staff captain, Jill was over all the Commodore's aides and coordinated with them. And this is now, inside his research room? That's in the research room, yeah. Now, where they are sitting is where the messengers would come and respond and answer back on any messages that we had. We would go and we'd stand in front of those chairs and talk to him. Now, when we would change watches, 
the new person coming on watch goes into the research room with the person who's been on watch. And we would go, my relief is here, sir, and salute at him. And uh, the other messenger would then say, reporting for duty, sir. And then he would say, well done, honey, or uh, you had a bit of a rough day or excellent job. And then you would leave. And any time you got a well done or a very well done, you were definitely very happy about that. And sometimes <laughs> you got those even though he might have yelled at you that day. But at least you finished the watch on good terms. Got it. But can I ask you a couple of questions here? Yes. All right. What what year roughly would you say this is? This picture, uh, probably the early 70s. I just wanted to make a comment. Now, Hannah and and uh, Jill, they were senior executives for all of Scientology, right? As his aides, isn't that correct? Yes. Yes. Yeah. I just wanted to point out the fact that this was this was young women in charge of Scientology. In other words, you know, it, in society, women never really rose the ranks, you know, until years later. But uh, you know, in the Sea Organization, Hubbard would, you know, promote women, and most of the people that worked at the top with him were women. Isn't that right? That's that's true. The women actually moved to the top faster, and uh, held their positions longer than the men. Yeah, so he was ahead of his time a little bit on that. It goes to show you that I mean. I'm not defending Hubbard here, right? But but he treated people the same, whether or not they were male, female, whatever. It didn't matter. It was whether or not you could do the job and be competent at it and communicate. It, right? it, exactly. If you could do the job, it didn't matter if you're male or female. It was your job. Right. Okay. Here's the next one. Okay. Uh, we, I'd shown this one before in part one. This is on a deck, the deck below the Commodore's office where his uh, cabin was. And we would sit there and while he was in his cabin. And um, he had, when he would wake up, he had a little red button that he would push and a buzzer would go off and a red light would light up and would mean that he wanted his steward. Later on, it became the messengers who would respond to that. But um, when he would go into session, which we called research, uh, we would have to, we had another switch we would turn on that would light up in the engine room and in the decks below to indicate to everyone on the ship that, that the Commodore is researching and to be quiet. Now, and, and research research really meant he was, he was processing himself or auditing he, someone, right? He was processing himself. Right. Um, yeah, and we always just called that research because that's what he said, or he was right. auditing. And there's times he said he'd done his research now and now has OT8 on up to 14. But that was when we had old OT7. That was before the new OT7 solo knots. Right. Yeah, just so, so people know, I mean, Hubbard, a lot of the things that he developed – he did on himself first before he had uh, before he piloted it on other uh, people. Uh, Janice on, and I have a long history of being guinea pigs, if you will, on some of the early processes when they first came. You know, when he first was developing them, we'd be some of the first people who would actually receive them, right, Janice? Correct. Yeah. Correct. And that's your sister Terry, right? Yeah, that's my sister Terry. Now, also when he was sleeping or in session we used to have to make sure everything was quiet and, and it was our job which also included making sure nobody walked on the deck above which was the port side promenade deck you can go to the next picture okay there's you can see the rope behind terry to stop people going over to the port side and uh, we'd put that up when he would secure or go in session next slide okay that's me. It was cold outside, <laughs> sitting in the doorway, looking miserable. <laughs> and I was in the doorway because it was it was cold. So, next one. The next one. Next slide. Yeah, next slide. Okay. Okay, and that that is the promenade deck. Uh, this is actually the starboard side. 
but um, the port side pretty much looks the same. So it really didn't matter which side I showed you. Right. And then above is obviously the lifeboats, right? And, yeah, the uh, go ahead. Yes, the lifeboats are above. And actually, when we were in the Caribbean, when it got really hot, <laughs> that's what um, I was going to say. Go ahead. Above his cabin, we would run saltwater hoses over the deck in order to try and cool off the cabins below. And what were the lifeboats used for in the Caribbean as well at night? To sleep. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. The staff didn't want to be in the dormitories below deck. They would sleep up top, right? Yeah. Well. We had no air conditioning on the ship. We had a blower system which blew out hot or cold air, depending on what the engine room would set it at. And either right. the air went, you know, through it was heated up by the hot water system from the boiler, or it was cooled off by the salt water. But just having the air blowing out sometimes was not enough when you're in really humid areas. And yeah. so it was cooler to sleep out on deck in the lifeboats than in the dormitories where they're sleeping with 60 other people. Right. Okay. This is a forward, uh, the, the forward well deck. That's my ex sister-in-law Doreen. And uh, she later became a messenger. When we went from four messengers to seven, Doreen became one of those seven. Now, I put this picture here to remind me of before she became a messenger, she was, uh, a lot of the young kids used to go to the forward hold and hang out in the forward hold, and there was a hammock there, and they just kind of, it was like a hangout place. And uh, the story behind that is Doreen was down there, and uh, Arthur Hubbard was down there, and he swung that hammock as Doreen was trying to get on it, or something and she ends up falling off of it and she couldn't move and she had to be over to the left was a boom uh, crane that would be used to bring things in and out of the hold and move them to the dock so Doreen not being able to move actually had to be lifted out of the hold using the crane and wow. lowered ashore and put in an ambulance and taken to the hospital and, you know, she wasn't there for very long, but as a result of this, when the Commodore found out about it, you know, I don't think I'd ever seen him so mad when, when he found out about it. And he had Arthur, who was part of the uh, problem with this, he had Arthur called to his office. Uh -huh. And Arthur was just my young teenager at the time, maybe 12 or something like that. But he, the Commodores let loose to Arthur for negligence and having been involved with Doreen getting hurt. And I don't think Arthur messed up again or anything like that. <laughs> I mean, it was scary the way the mood Hubbard was in from hearing what happened to Doreen. Right. Okay. And there's Doreen again. Now she's become an actual messenger. And this is actually a posed photograph. But, you know, we did bring the folders, PC folders. Those are pre-clear folders. We bring those back and forth to him so that he could do the case supervising um, of the auditing done that day. Right. Okay. And that's my brother who worked in the engine room. And Peter he Gillum, actually, Jr., right? <laughs> Peter Gillum Jr., yes. Yeah. And uh, he ends up marrying Doreen. She was Doreen Smith and became Doreen Gillum. Okay. All right. So then, as I was talking, we added three new messengers. In the middle there is Molly. So there was Doreen and Molly. And this picture is Molly with Terry on the left and Annie on the right. They're off on Liberty together. That looks like uh, Lisbon or Madeira. Okay. And there's Annie doing the makeup for Molly. This this is getting ready to go on Liberty? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> or, or maybe a ship's party. We, ha we did have parties, which I heard later on they didn't have parties anymore, but we'd find any excuse, the crew would, or the port captain's office, and we'd we would have parties. Right. Okay. 
All right. And then the seventh messenger was Clarice. You can see her there on the right. Okay, who's Clarice? Clarice Barnett. She is actually Shelley's older sister. Shelley Miscavige's older sister. Shelley Miscavige's older sister, Clarice Barnett. Mm -hmm. And she's on duty there while the Commodore is talking to James Byrne. A lot of people from Gold would know who James is and people right. from the Free Winds. James, actually, I've known James since I was 10 years old at St. Hill. Wow. He was my he was there doing the academy levels and did my grades. Right. And Clarice, Clarice is still in, unfortunately. Um, she eventually got married to John Brousseau, uh, who some people who watch this channel will know who John is. Um, but Clarice also uh um her what was her nickname? She had several. We called her C B. But she also was known as Pooh. Pooh Bear, yeah, right? We also, yeah, we also <laughs> called her Pooh. <laughs> For the Pooh Bear and Winnie the Pooh. <laughs> yes. We always had this, you know, sort of, you know, demeanor like, mm, you know, she was a really nice girl, but she was like, mm, you know, nothing really phased her. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, there was one time she actually hurt her, her eye. And so yeah. she had her hair coming down over her eye and she was called Cyclops. Oh, <laughs> Yeah, teenagers can be uh, uh, brutal sometimes. Yes. Okay. So there on the bridge is uh, the Commodore, and to the right, that's me. Really? And it, uh, yeah, I got. Yeah. I wasn't yeah, no, no, it's okay. I, yeah. I wasn't important, so I got cut out. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I actually put this here to remind me of a story when when I was younger. I was the. Um, on the walkie talkie on the bow of the ship forward. So the the Commodore or whoever was on the bridge and overseeing the docking of the ship would communicate with me. And then I would then tell the forward in charge what the bridge was saying so that they'd put out whatever lines. Well, one of these days we were sailing into um, uh, Melilla in Spanish Morocco Mm -hmm. And I'm on I'm on the walkie-talkie to the bridge, and suddenly John Axel, who is on the forward lines, he he threw a monkey line out, which is the line with the with a fist on it, right. and he throw it to the person on the dock, and then they can pull the the line the cable down that's going to hold the ship to the dock. Mm -hmm. Well, he threw the monkey line overboard, but he hadn't tied it to the line. The oh. ship's line. So suddenly he dives over the side. <laughs> and everyone's like, what? And the Commodore's on the bridge, like, what the hell just happened? <laughs> who, who dived over? Why is he over there? And I'm now looking over the side and, and reporting back up to the bridge that John Axel threw the monkey line over without it being tied and he's and he dove over to get it. And John comes up and he's all proud, holding the monkey line. He managed to get it. Well, a, a couple of years later, we, we sail into Melilia and the ship's pilot comes aboard. And I'm, I happen to be on watch again. And we, we walk down the deck to meet the pilot. And as we're walking back up the deck to go to the bridge, the pilot pulls out some glasses. They were John Axel's glasses oh <laughs> add on when he dove over the side. And uh, the the poor in Melilia, they'd gone, they had to send some divers down to get some stuff and they found the glasses and they knew we'd come back. So the pilot kept them on his desk the whole time <laughs> and then gave them to Hubbard so that they could be returned to John Axel. That's a great story. Okay, yeah. here's the next one. And this is the, uh, in Madeira, we would walk along the seawall. And that's in and Spain, the, right? Madeira, Madeira, Spain, right? No, Madeira is a Portuguese island Portugal. in the Atlantic. Okay, Got it. Yeah. But we'd walk down the seawall and then we'd climb down that ladder to get to a platform down below and then we would go swimming down there. And one time we actually had an outer old student who fell from this top all the way down. And uh, we then had to set up a whole rig in order to bring him back up because he cracked his head and get him to the hospital. 
And uh, years later, he came back to gold, actually, as an auditor. And he seemed pretty normal. But at the time when he left, he was still, I guess he still had bruising of the brain. But, yeah, we used to climb up and down that ladder to go swimming. Okay. And that's down at the bottom where we used to go swimming. Who's who's that? that? That's me on the right. I'm wearing my old swimming track suit. And that looks like Nancy Tidman, Annie's sister. And Where, in, in the center Orcott. or on the left? In the center. Okay. And then uh, Jeanette Orcock on the left. Okay. Okay, this, we used to also swim off the side of the ship. Putting on the flippers is Arthur Hubbard. Uh, bending over in the red swimsuit is Donna Tidman, who is Annie's younger sister. And then you can see the back of me. I'm in the green bikini on the left. And we used to just open up the gates, the, the doors at the well deck and uh, climb down a ladder or jump in. But this is where they used to do the overboards from. Oh. Okay. And uh, I'm going to go more into the overboards in another series. Okay. But... I just wanted to show that we did go swimming out of the same area. Let and me ask you a question. When would this be? Would this be on your day off or time off? Like when would you guys, like did you have to get permission to do this sort of thing? No, lunch or dinner. We had an yeah. hour for lunch, an hour for dinner, and we would just run and get in our swimsuits and go diving off the ship. Got it. Got it. Okay. Yeah, and, and that's. Land ho, who's there? Who's there? <laughs> Yeah, you can see the, uh, I think that's me down there. you got to point out where. You mean the lower left, right? The lower left, and then there's two more people in the upper right. Okay. But, you know, every port we went to, we used to just go swimming. And there's times we'd get out and you look down and there's a shark and you're like, oh, boy. Uh, <laughs> that would happen in Tangier. Uh, in Casablanca once, um, I got stung. Uh, we always assumed it was a Portuguese man of war that uh, wrapped around my arm, and my arm swelled to double its size. And uh, the Commodore had me put pneumonia on it, and that made it swell to the point where all the welts kind of ripped apart. <laughs> <laughs> and my arm was a mess. Anyway, with big bandages and I, from, from that. Okay. But great. who knows what was in that water, but we didn't care. We just, we enjoyed the swim yeah. and we just all just jump off the side. Yeah. Okay. This is in Madeira one night on Liberty. A bunch of us decided to go camping. And uh, that's Molly there and Annie on the left, Molly on the right. Okay. And we lasted till probably three o'clock in the morning, but it was too cold and nobody could sleep. And we all packed up and uh, went back down to the ship to our warm beds. Got it. This is the Chris Craft. I had pointed this out in part one, mm -hmm. where my sister and I were helping Des Popham clean it. And in this picture, uh, the various aides. On the helm is Joan Robertson, and that's Des Popham, who's the LRH transport in charge next to her. And behind him, that looks like uh, Ellen Reynolds. And then behind her is Tony Dunleavy, the, one, the gentleman in the beard. And then in the brown jacket towards the front, that's Judy Ziff. And the lighter jacket, that's Louise Schecht Aquarion. She's been uh, done some interviews with Tony Ortega. Yeah. So people can listen to hers, her stories. And then in the white sweater, that's Sandra Johnson. And at the very back, uh, that looks like John Horwich. Okay. And then the other two people, I'm not too sure. Oh, the, the lady standing in the middle, that looks like Vicki Livingston. Vicky Palomini. Okay. Yeah. And that's uh, the Commodore on the Flying Bridge with Andre Tabioyan. Andre uh, 
he was usually on the decks and stuff, but he later was assigned the job. Having been in Vietnam Special Forces, the Commodore had him train the messengers on judo. So the seven of us would all show up. Well, be five of us at a time would show up for judo because the other two were on watch with the Commodore. And we would go to the sun deck and uh, Andre would give us judo lessons all so that we could defend ourselves if we needed to. Yeah. We just recently saw him. Um, you know, I had a lot of experience with Andre when we were at the, you know, the Gold Base, International Base in Gilman Hot Springs. And I hadn't seen him since we left in 1990, but just, what, just a, two, three months ago when you started on your trip, we actually got to see him. And he's, he's doing well for anybody who knows yeah. Andre. Yeah. Now, Andre was also, uh, he later became the Commodore steward. And I've told in, my, in one of my interviews with Aaron, when I was talking about Morocco and uh, that country blowing up on us, Andre was the Commodore steward at the time that drove the Commodore from Tangier to Casablanca and put him on the airplane to Lisbon. Okay. Okay. All right, so here is on the poop deck, the very back of the ship, and that's the Commodore giving a, a dirk to my mother. What's a dirk? A dirk is a knife. And she, she was awarded that for power missions that she had done. And <laughs> when this... Sorry. When this was... Go ahead. Okay. When this was awarded to her, she had actually just done a mission where uh, the Commodore was in, um, where was he? Marseille, France. And he had been living ashore in a villa. And when he came to go back to and move back to the Apollo for the Royal Scotsman, it was found out that no one had taken his passport and checked him through immigration. So he was actually illegally in France. And that became a big PR flap. Uh -huh. And my mother was sent on mission and she had to calm everything down and get him checked into France and checked back out so that they wouldn't arrest him as illegally in France. And that's when he awarded her with that for that power mission. Right. Yeah, that, that became like... Uh part of your uniform, if you got awarded a, a, a dirk, it's like a dagger, um, and you would wear it on special occasions. It wasn't something that, you know, somebody used to cut rope or anything like that, right? Right. No, they had a different knives for that. That was awarded. This one's after that, a higher status. That's right. And unfortunately, well, unfortunately or fortunately, however you want to look at it, Hubbard later was convicted of fraud in France years later before he passed away. He couldn't go into France anymore. That's, that's right. Okay, next slide. All right, here is a muster on the dock, but I specifically wanted to point this one out because the people in the green boiler suits in the back, those were the class eight trainees. Uh -huh. All the class eights wore green boiler suits so that you could tell them apart from anybody else. Explain what class eight is. A class eight at that time was the highest auditor training you could do. You uh -huh. could do uh, levels one to four, which was the um, academy. Right. And then you could do St. Hill Special Briefing course, which was up to class six. Then there was class seven, who were the auditors for power processing, uh -huh. which was grade five and 5A, five plus. And then class eight um, was used as the top of the line auditors. They had to be flawless. They could do repairs and all that kind of stuff on anybody. Got it. So my mother was assigned to the class eight course because she was already a central special briefing course graduate. Uh-huh. And uh, so she was on the ship for a while, just, to, well, actually just a few months doing it. And if any of these class eights flubbed a session, meaning they didn't get an FN, a floating needle, with um, good indicators on the PC, then they were thrown overboard. And overboards was a common thing. It was entertainment for the Greeks. Because <laughs> they would line up in their little rowboats, they'd row out every morning, they'd know what time we would do overboards and they'd watch people getting thrown over the side. Uh, so the class eights would get 
thrown over the side for order to flops. Different crew would get thrown over for different flops. You'd find out the next morning of being the ood saying, the ood's as in orders of the day, you know, who's to be thrown overboard that day. And the MAA would muster everybody and read the list and you'd have to step forward. And then the two people would stand there and from the well deck, they would throw you over the side and they say, commit your sins and errors to the deep and hope you arise a better Thetan. And then you get chucked over the side. Let me ask you a question about that, okay? Yeah. Was it was was this some kind of lighthearted punishment, or did, was it actually pretty? Like, would people be pretty upset if they had to be thrown overboard at that time? It, you know, it could get pretty upsetting. I mean, those who knew how to swim, you kind of just take it, okay. You know, and it was more the embarrassment of it. But there were people that didn't know how to swim, and I remember Leon Steinberg being thrown out from the cattle doors, which is only maybe four feet up. But he didn't know how to swim. And so they put a life vest on him, one of those old 1950s ones that it's right here and in the back. Mm -hmm. And he goes in the water and it just pushes the head up, you know, and then the person's flopping around because they don't know what to do. Right. And I know from when Amos Jessup was the captain of the Avon River, later the uh -huh. Athena, they were pop, they were docked behind us. And Amos several times because people didn't know how to swim and they just end up floating off with the tide, had to pull them out of the, catch them and pull them out of the water. That's terrible. But it, 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 it was terrible. And there were some people that ended up having their hands and feet tied. Um, well, how, hold on a second. Hold, so whose idea was this? Is this LRH's idea or, or was it Yes, it was an LRH idea on the overboards. It's terrible. And, uh, it was terrible. And there were times even if he was up late working and he was still up at seven in the morning when the crew got up and did the overboards, he'd even stand there and look over the side and watch the overboards. He knew it was going on. It was not some something withheld from him. He initiated wow. it and he ordered people overboard. And then it became a pattern for the executives to then order other people overboard. I even yeah. got thrown overboard. It's crazy. I mean, because during my entire time in the Sea Org, we we didn't we weren't at sea. Of course, we were at land, and that never happened. But then Miscavige then implemented it after we left. From uh, when you read Mark Headley's book, Blown for Good, I mean, he talks about you know lining everybody up in management uh, to first at first to walk off the diving board of the pool, and then later on to throw them in this scuzzy pondy lake that we had at the property. Right. And it's it's. it's it's really dehumanizing. It is. I mean, I would be embarrassed and I also would feel, you know, pretty degraded if that had happened to me. Right. Well, in, in, AOS, in, in England, in Edinburgh, Doreen Casey was the commanding officer there and she actually had people's heads flushed in the toilet because what? she could, yep. Cause she couldn't throw them overboard. And, and that, that stop was put to that. And then in uh, L.A., they were hosing people down. It's crazy. But yeah, it just gets insane when one punishment starts and then it just gets worse and worse and worse. Yeah. And it's, you know, when I hear these things, I go like, how would people put up with that? You know, I mean, I never saw something like that when I was in. But then the most gruesome thing that could happen to you when I was in the Sea Org was you get assigned to the Rehabilitation Project Force. And you kind of sort of accepted it because you messed up or whatever, and you sort of went along with it. But right. from the outside looking in, it, it was really dehumanizing. And, uh, you know, the idea was to correct the person, but it, it really was to, you know, uh, embarrass them. It was them to shame and, them. It shamed yeah, them shame. as well. That, it that's was terrible. Word. Shame, shame. Yeah. Okay, let's go back to the slideshow here. Here we go. Okay, so in 1969, um, my mother started Celebrity Center. And it was started off as a booking office. She had been over at AOLA, and she was an exec over there, and she started handing the celebrities... Ex explain AOLA. Oh, uh, Advanced Organization Los Angeles. So okay. that's where people got... Oh, they got uh, OT1 two and they audited OT3 there. Okay. 
And that's her in the middle in the skirt with the beads around her neck. So she's got the light skirt with the dark sweater. Yeah, and the yeah. and the beads. Yeah. yeah. So she started as a booking office where she was going to work with the different celebrities and you know work with them so that and drill them so that they would feel confident in going to do an audition or whatever it was they were working on. And um, to her right is Bette Blundell. Bette, Bette is the mother of one of the very original messengers, Julie, that I pointed out in um, the first part. Okay. And then right behind her, that's Sam, um, Sam, Sam Lauria. I don't know where Sam is now, but he later became the commanding officer of the advanced organization in Los Angeles. I remember him. Yep. And to my mother's left is Joyce Myers. And uh, she was her deputy. Now, if you go uh, two more people down, the third, uh, she's like in the middle of the people from the end and Joyce. You have to say left or right. Otherwise, to the left in the white skirt with the black vest. Okay. That's Janet Whalen. Oh, Janet Thompson, sure. who married Kurt Whalen. Yeah. And is still in. Yeah. And right yeah. behind yeah. her is Bobby okay. Lyons. Okay. He's st he's still active. And then if we go over to the right, standing there with his arms folded, a big grin on his face and a mustache is Jeff Levin. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. That's great. Let me ask you, and then your mother's name was Yvonne Gillum, right, at that time? Yes, and yeah. then later, go ahead. Later, she married Heber Heber Jens. Right. And I was, uh, gonna say, I was, I was just going to say that, you know, people referred to L. Ron Hubbard as Ron. If you were a public, it was Ron. You're writing a letter to Ron. Ron will handle it. You know, this this isn't Sea Org members. This is staff, right? Well, the only other person really that was known by one name in Scientology was Yvonne. People knew Yvonne. Yvonne was the celebrity center. Yvonne was this. It was Yvonne that, you know. So she had quite an image, almost like Cher, you know. People knew who right. Yvonne was, right? <laughs> right. And that, that actually became true with me, too. Everyone knew who Janice was. And I remember I remember a telex coming to me, and it was addressed to Janice. And the Commodore looking at it and going, what's this? Why isn't your job title on there? Why does it just say Janice? <laughs> and I'm like, because that's who I am. <laughs> I think also what made you unique was the spelling of your name because most people spell, at least in America, as J A N I C E. And I, I, you're the only person I ever knew that was J A N I S. Yeah. So is it, yeah, it's easy to find you that way. Next slide. Okay, next one. Okay. All right, so there is Molly on the left and Terry on the right. Uh, both were messengers at the time. This is when we had just the seven messengers. Mm -hmm. Terry and Molly were sent off on mission to Los Angeles and that left five of us back at the ship and we've just we would you know adjust watches to cover for them mm -hmm. but Molly went on a mission to LA org Los Angeles org organization right organization and the reason for her mission was the executives in the Los Angeles area had been involved in postulate checks. You have to explain this, what that is. <laughs> this meant that the public had written a check that there was no money backing, but they were postulating, as in praying or hoping for, that money would come in to support that check. Uh huh. Anyway, so this became a huge flap. The income was being counted which included postulated money that didn't exist. So the Commodore wanted one of the messengers on that mission for experience because they were to go to LA org and clean up LA org for the criminality of count of getting people to write checks that there was no money for. Right. And this was actually then the start of where we ended up with the, uh, command team to Boston. Right. Uh, Alex Zabersky, Kerry Gleason, Bill Foster, Dave Foster, uh, you know, a whole group of them were all sent to Boston as amends 
forget doing these postulate checks. And I, I, I've, not, I've heard also that Pat Broker was the flag banking officer. That, that was Pat was not involved apparently in the postulate checks, but he was sent to be the right. banking officer and to keep them straight. Right. But yeah, that's where they were all sent to Boston Org to make amends and boom, Boston Org. Right. Okay. So here's the same time period. That's just Terry and Molly visiting with my mother. So Terry's on the right, Molly's on the left, and your mom in the center. Yes, mom's in the middle. Okay. Okay, here's a good picture. So my mom ends up meeting Heber. And if you look the front right person with the headband on and the striped pants and the little beard, that is Heber. With the glasses, right? With the glasses. Yeah. Yeah. And in this picture is a bunch of people from Celebrity Center. The left top is Amanda Ambrose. And it looks like Kenny Lipton next to her and Emily Becker in the middle in the back. And uh, Joyce Myers in the middle in the middle uh -huh. and next to her to the right with her arm around Hebrew Sue Pomeroy. Okay. Yeah. And that's your mom and mom sitting down, looking down, right? No, 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 that's Jan. That looks like Jan stone. That's the sister of Joyce Myers. Oh, okay. Yeah. But anyway, that's what he would look like when my mother met him and he wanted to marry her and she wouldn't marry him unless he joined the Sea Org. Yeah, he was an actor, right? He was an actor and a singer. He was in a band called Thank You World. Okay. And he was in the movie Paint Your Wagon with Clint Eastwood and Lee Marvin. I know I talked to him about it because I love yeah, that. But, it's a musical, but it's it, 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 I liked that movie a lot when I saw it as a kid. Yeah, and though he was still getting paid on it, all his parts ended up on the cutting room floor from what I heard. <laughs> but he was also in 1776 as well. Okay. Okay, this is the people. Uh, in the front there is Jeff Levin and his brother Robbie behind him. And in the middle left, that's uh, Al Rabisi. Okay. And, uh, they, they, you know, they were public at Celebrity Center. They were very close friends to my mom. And I, on the ship, I didn't know who all these different musicians were and stuff. The mom would send me photographs. So my cabin wall... You know how kids put posters up of you know different bands and so forth. I had this picture on my wall of the people. <laughs> and Jeff, Jeff is out of Scientology now, and and he, you're in touch with him, right? Oh yeah, yeah. Jeff just did a uh, film called The Broken Brothers. Got it. Okay. And and this is uh, Mike Herring. Mike Heron. Mike was part of the Incredible String Band. They were, they were a band. They, for people who don't know, they were a big group in the like late 60s, early 70s, right? Yes, yes. And uh, Susie Watson Taylor, who used to be at CMO and at ASI, used to be married to Mike. Okay. And Mike actually came to the ship as one of our original public people for auditing. And while he was there, he. He was my best friend during that time period. I would, anytime I was off watch, I would just spend it hanging out with him, you know, hanging over the rail, talking or whatever. But yeah, he was from the incredible string band and they were also part of the public of Celebrity Center. And I'd I like remember. to bring out, like, Celebrity Center was a booking office and turned into an organization and delivering services. And mom built it up to where she had over 200 staff. It was wow. the largest org in the world. Right. Where were they located then? They were downtown? They were downtown on 8th Street and, Al and close Angeles. to Alvarado. Yeah, in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. This picture of the Commodore, I took this one. I was wondering, is that one you took of it? <laughs> <laughs> I took this. And it was funny. We were out on deck. And he took a bunch of photos of me, and then he said, here, take one of me. So, I, you know, I took it of him. And when the film came back from England developed, because it was the old film that had to go and get developed, and yeah. it would be sent to England to get developed, and it would come back. And he was sitting in his desk, and I was on watch at the time. He, 
and he calls me in and he points to this picture and he's telling me what's wrong with it. I'm like, I don't know. You look great. Look at that laugh. You look fantastic. And he says, yeah, but I can't use it. Why? I don't know. I cut the top of his hat off. Ah, yeah. 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 I learned that. You learn that. You learn that in, in training at, at, when I was uh, over Golden Era Productions. The five C's of cinematography is you don't want to give somebody a haircut. You want to make sure you leave enough headroom uh, so that the picture can be cropped or whatever. I know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> right. Yeah. So I, I got told off. I, I learned at that point, don't cut people's head off. Yeah. But he, he actually, the pictures he took of me were pretty good. And he, he gave them to me and said, send these to your mother. So I did. And um, when she passed away, Heber wanted to keep them. So Heber has them. I see. Okay. Oh, that's uh, Terry and Claire. Just two of the original messengers. They, right. I just thought this was a cute picture to throw in here. It was, yeah. But, but also Claire, because the next picture is Mike Maurer, who she married. And uh, Mike, uh, some people knew Phoebe Maurer right. uh, from St. Hill Days and from Gold. Phoebe, and, Phoebe uh, actually was the minister when I got married to Julie. We had Phoebe uh, be the minister. His oh, mother. okay. Yeah. Well, and Michael is actually still in Scientology. He yeah. apparently lives in Clearwater and has a business there. But He's I knew he had the same thing. Internet security or software company. Yeah. Yeah. But I knew him back at St. Hill when I was 10 and he was 13. And, you know, there he was. He ends up marrying one of my best friends. So. Okay. Okay, so this is when Diana Hubbard got married to John Horwich. Mm -hmm. The Commodore is on the left, Mary Sue, and then Diana and John. And Suzette Hubbard was uh, the maid of honor, and Alan Buchanan was the best man. And this okay. picture was taken in the ADEC lounge, which was the Commodore's lounge, and also his dining room. Okay. And uh, they, they had one of L. Ron Hubbard's uh, grandchildren, uh, Rowan Hubbard, right? Rowan Horwich. Rowan Horwich is the daughter of uh, Diana and John, yes. And Diana's the only Hubbard still left working in Scientology, correct? Right, in the in management PR office the last time I heard. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And uh, this is just a nice picture of Mary Sue uh, holding hands with the Commodore on the A deck during the people getting ready to leave the ship to go to the reception. Okay. And then this was the reception. They actually booked a restaurant in town. I believe it was Agadir, but it was definitely Morocco. Uh -huh. And from left to right, left blonde in the back is Quentin. And then Arthur with Quentin, the Quentin Hubbard. Blonde here. Quentin Hubbard. Quentin Hubbard, yes, and then Arthur Hubbard. They're both the sons of uh, Ron and Mary Sue. Right. And then Diana's in the blue dress, leaning out from behind the pole next to John. And they're actually watching a snake performance uh, <laughs> by some local performers. And then Mary Sue there with Ron. And then uh, Nikki Who? is uh, Nikki Freeman. Lady Merwin, she was Mary Sue's communicator for years. And she's in the blue dress or blue and green She's dress? in the blue dress with the stripes. And then just just the very little head peeking in is Joan Robertson. Okay. And this, um, this is the Snipes. The Snipes were the engineers on the ship. And this picture is a bunch of them, they went and got motorbikes, or 50cc motorbikes, so they could easily be taken on and off the ship. And on the left is uh, John Orcock. And with his hands up like this, that's Richard Orcock. We all called him Whack. Right. And the reason we called him Whack is he used to have a beard like John did. And then when he shaved it off and left the mustache, we used to call him El Wacko. Because... <laughs> And so then that the name became Whack. Got it. And then uh, next to Whack on the motorbike, that's my brother Peter. 
And then next to him at the very end, standing up taller with the messed up hair, that's uh, John Blythe, that's Biddy Miscavige's brother. Okay. Anyway, when the, when the Snipes got their motorbikes, they actually taught the messengers how to ride. And so we used to ride their bikes around on the dock. And in Morocco, we would ride them because if it was 50 cc or under, you didn't need a license. Uh -huh. And so we would drive around Tangier and Casablanca and Agadir on these motorbikes because we didn't need a license and we were totally underage, you know, 14, 15 years old, um, riding around because there was no no limit. If we went in Portugal, you need to be 16 and have to get a license. Got it. So in Morocco, we did a lot of bike riding. And that's it for that one. Okay, and then this is the ship in dry dock. And this is brings me into a new chapter, which will be part three. But in Tangier, we moved ashore and as the ship went into dry dock. And so that'll be part three. And I just wanted to end it on that. Okay, great. Let me ask you a couple of questions, Janice. Looking okay. back on all these photographs, it seems like a pretty exciting you know, you're a teenager or whatever. It seemed pretty exciting time, you know, traveling the Mediterranean and going to Morocco and, and Lisbon and Portugal and all that. Did, was it like that for you? Yeah, well, I didn't know any different. That's what I grew up with, you know. Um, last, you know, I'd lived in a house up until I was 10 years old, and then right. it was a ship for my, all my teenage years. So I really didn't know much and I, I did look forward to going to certain point ports. Um, it was different. It made me grow up faster. What was your living condition like? Did you guys have your own cabin, or how did how did, you were were you in dormitories or what on the ship? We I started off in a dormitory, uh -huh. and then when the commodore was coming aboard, anyone under twelve had to go into the nursery. So I was moved into the nursery. And I managed to somehow finagle my way out of there and get back into the woman's dorm. But when I became a messenger, I pulled status and got a cabin. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, I usually bunked with Claire. Claire and I had a cabin together because there was two bunks to each cabin. Okay. And there was a period um, in 72 where I managed to get a single room cabin. So I had a cabin to myself, but then I ended up, um, they wanted that for one of the aides. So I ended up uh, in a cabin again with Jill Goodman, who later became a messenger. Okay. And how was the food? I've, it, you've never talked about the food. Was it any good? Um. <laughs> Let's say there were times it was good, but the majority it was not. Uh -huh. um, it was kind of slop yeah. or overcooked or, you know, it was a greasy spoon type food. Would you get different food from different ports? Like, you know, like, you know, like Spanish food in Spain and, and, and Moroccan food no. in Morocco, or was it just always, you know, British, English food or whatever? It, it depended on who was the cooks. Uh -huh. So if we had Spanish cooks, it, we did have more Spanish food, but we got rid of all the, the Spanish help that weren't Scientologists and was replaced by new recruits. So when Sven Peterson came and he was the cook, we got a lot of Swedish meatballs. <laughs> um you know, so it really depended, and oh, there was one point where we got all of our food from the different ports we went to. We'd sail into Lisbon. We'd look forward to that because we actually got better fruit and vegetables there that we weren't allowed to eat in Morocco because there was concern of getting sick <coughs> from the food there. Right. And in, in Portugal, we got fresh milk. But it came in those great big um, aluminum cans. Yeah. And you'd you'd put a spoon, big scooper in there, and scoop out the milk. Oh. 
Uh, it didn't come in the little containers and stuff like that. But we didn't get milk in Morocco. We but we look forward to it in Portugal. Right. And then at one point, the purchaser arranged to get shipments from Rotterdam. So we'd have big containers shipped down to us, and that was good. We got ice cream with that. We got steaks with that. The food definitely improved when we started getting it from Rotterdam because it was cheaper than buying local. Got it. Okay. Well, that and more stories are covered in Janice's has two books. Uh, this is Commodore's Messenger Book One. And that's you on the uh, Apollo with L. Ron Hubbard, correct? Yes. Right. And uh, show the cover. Here's the cover of the second book right here. Right. And that's you as Again, a me with the Commodore about three, four years later. Got it. You can get these books. They're both available on Amazon, and there's links in the descriptions. Okay. Also, the book one is on audio, and there's a link for that as well if you'd like to order the audio version of the book. Okay. Also, I wanted to mention too in the description, I'm going to put a link to part one of our story about L. Ron Hubbard's messengers. So if you haven't seen part one and you want to, uh, you can go to our page and click on it. And uh, you can watch it there. And uh, I think you'll find it. There's a lot of photos that, uh, like I said, had not been seen before. So I think you'll enjoy it. OK. And also, we want to ask you, please subscribe to our channel. If you like what you see, um, you know, we would really appreciate your, your liking it and checking that uh, check mark and notification and and subscribe because it actually gets our stories out to more and more people. We're get, we've only been doing this for three weeks and we've, we've gotten quite a few subscribers, but there's a lot more out there. So if you're, if you're enjoying our stuff and you'd like to see more, please subscribe. Yeah, and we do plan to have some old timers come on. We're just lining that up and uh, we'll interview some old timers so you don't have to just listen to me. And then of course, we're gonna do uh, live question and answer sessions as well. We did one earlier this week and we'll do another one soon and where you can ask your questions. But in the meantime, if you have a question today on, on this uh, video that you've watched, please leave it in the comments. Janice and I read every comment. And if it's, there's a question, we try and answer it as best we can. Right, Janice? Correct. Okay. Well, that's uh, the show, people. I hope our friends, I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, we'll be seeing you soon on our next video. Janice, thanks so much for sharing everything with us. You're welcome. We'll just keep peeling the onion. That's right. Onion peelers. <laughs> Bye, everybody. <laughs>